No? Okay. So today, the plan was to have uh, Sheikh Ahmed Al Sayyid to come. But unfortunately, uh, there was a miscommunication or misunderstanding, and he thought he was supposed to come after Dhuhr. Um, just give me one second. Sound isn't on. Yeah, I, it is now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Assalamualaikum. So, where was I? We're saying that Sheikh Ahmed Al Sayyid, there was a misunderstanding. He was supposed to come a little bit earlier. But now, um, we're going to move on, inshallah. We're already a little bit delayed. And today's topic is going to be how to present and how to give a speech. And um, we're going to take some examples from the Prophet's life, inshallah. If you don't know me, my name's Saad, by the way. Okay. I'll be delivering our small lecture today. And then after the salah, we're going to have a little activity as well. So. You guys should be prepared. Maybe some of you will talk in front of the rest. And um, well, it will be like basic topics. So I'll choose a couple of basic topics and I'll give you that topic. And you'll have maybe three minutes to present. Okay? It will be like salah or it will be like fasting. Or something like that. But then you have to try and talk to a crowd and that's the main thing we want to build our confidence in speaking in front of people and that only happens from practice so let's start bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in so can someone tell me why it is important to learn how to give a speech or orate. So I'll give a little bit of background. Back in the Prophet ﷺ's time, what was the thing that people would value a lot? If a man was able to do a certain thing, eloquence and poetry. What was your answer? Eloquence and poetry. Does anyone remember any names from the Prophet's time who were known to be eloquent and orate? Who were able to talk to crowds and convince them and move them? Sayyidam al Kadhab is he's one. <laughs> he, he actually uh, claimed prophethood, right? And a lot, and his tribe started following him. Amr ibn al As. Who is Amr ibn al As? Does anyone remember? <laughs> Subhanallah. Jazakumullah khair. That's right. Huh. Because of his Najashi, you're saying Amr ibn Al-As became Muslim because of Najashi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and there was also another spokesperson from the Muslims. Do you remember? Who spoke to Nijashi on behalf of Muslims? Yes. Yes. And who is the Jafar? The? The cousin of the Prophet. And also, I believe, the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, right? So, these people, we remember them 
in their speeches as well. What they said in very monumental times, when they went to the speaker, when they went to that stage to go and present, to present an idea. Back then, they were presenting Islam. They were presenting Islam to people of high levels. Kings, Amirs, Wazirs, Malik. And even today, when someone goes, when a Muslim leader goes and presents to a king, they must also choose their words very wisely in order to have the best effect. Hassan al-Basri is a prime example. He would also give nasiha to the Malik, Abu Huraira. And then we have someone from the time of Jahiliya. He later became Muslim. And he was known to speak and speak against Islam. And his name was Suhail ibn Amr. Suhail ibn Amr was also a very eloquent orator of pre-Islamic times. And then he became Muslim and he would use that for the cause of Islam. And we also have Hassan ibn Thabit. Hassan ibn Thabit is from the Prophet's companions, who was a poet. But Prophet would say to Hassan, go and write poetry against the Quraysh. Or go, Jibreel is going to help you. So this ability to bring people together, the Prophet ﷺ, of course, being the most eloquent, right? Prophet ﷺ, he himself was given wahi. And all the prophets, all the prophets والسلام, they were given this responsibility of presenting Islam to their people. And they had to do it in the best way. For example, Prophet Nuh, 950 years, he was giving da'wah to his people. And what did it say in the Quran? قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي دَعُوتُ قَوْمِي لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا وَإِنِّي كُلَّمَا دَعُوتُهُمْ لِتَغْفِرَ لَهُمْ جَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَاسْتَغْشَوْا ثِيَابَهُمْ وَأَصَرُوا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا اسْتِكْبَارًا He said, I would call my people day and night. But that did not increase, uh, my calling to them did not increase them, except that they ran away from me. And whenever I call them, so that they may ask for forgiveness, they would put their fingers in their ears and they would turn away in arrogance. As khatibs, when you're going to be delivering, it's very uh, important that you understand where you're standing, who you're representing. So we already understand that we're going to be representing the Prophet ﷺ on the minbar. When we go up and we deliver the khutbah, we have to choose our words very carefully. Otherwise, it can turn people away. Otherwise, the message may get distorted. Otherwise, there can be misunderstandings. So it's important for what? Choose your words wisely. Number one. And when you're presenting, we'll, we'll, I'm just going to, right now, I'm starting off from talking about what? Islamic significance. Why it's important and how the people of our past, they would orate. The Khulafa, all of them were good orators. Umar, Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali. They would all have to go and talk to the people. The Imam, he also talked about the Imam's role, right? It's not just giving khut khutbahs and whatever. The Imam's role, he's in the community. He's seeing what's, what are people, what, what are their concerns. And then he'll come to the minbar and then he'll address the concerns. So this is something to remember. And then if we look throughout time, Right? The mimbar, we talked about it before. It was used in many different ways. Some people have different attentions. Sometimes they want to spread a specific thing on the mimbar, which may not be correct. So when you go up there, it's really important that you know where you're getting your knowledge and your, your words from. 
you have sources to back it up. We'll be talking about research and topic selection in another one to come. But you have to know yani, if you're getting it from a, a credible source, whatever you're saying. Each word, each sentence you're forming, it has cre credible evidence behind it. But now, today what we want to talk about is how to give a speech. And we've, alhamdulillah, I believe where we live, if you were raised up in Canada, you've been learning how to present throughout the grades. Even if, you're if, even if you're in university, there's perhaps one or a couple of classes where you have to stand up in front of a crowd and present. And the tips that they give are not too different from when you go up on the mimbar. For example, when you're talking to a crowd, you're not talking into a void. You're not just talking to yourself. You have to make eye contact with people. And that's important. Sometimes it's scary to make eye contact. And you're like, shy away, I don't want to look at him. You see a sheikh in the crowd, I don't want to see. But they say a couple of tricks when you're actually wanting to make eye contact. Don't look them straight in the eye. Perhaps look a little bit above their eye right above their head so that you're not actually staring right into someone's or maybe they're not staring right into your soul right so try your best to look at people engage with them what happens a lot when we see in khutbas is someone is getting distracted on their phone one guy is sleeping over there right not you not you one guy is over there just gazing into the stars and uh, we're wondering yani, come on we're in a khutbah right now we have to give the most attention as we can some people and that's why the responsibility on the person presenting is so much these people who come to the Jum'a khutbah perhaps that's their only source of Islamic knowledge for the whole week take that in so you have to give them as much value as possible. Otherwise, they're going to keep on going and they will perhaps not change. One of the main purposes of giving a Jum'a, a, a khutbah, is to remind people of taqwa. So that is something you will begin the khutbah with. You'll say, Inna alhamdulillahi na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu. There is something called khutbah al haja that you should begin the khutbah with. And then you can recite a verse and a hadith from Surah An-Nisa. The first verse of Surah An-Nisa is usually enough. And then there's also the verse from Surah Ali Imran and Ahzab if you want to go ahead and add that. So those things in the beginning, try your best to memorize. If not, you should have a paper with you and you can read it off of there as well. There's no uh, worry in doing that. Especially if you're just beginning to give khutbahs. You'll see the imams, even some of them, they carry a paper with them. Well, some of them, they don't. Some of them, when they get up there, they get in the groove. They don't need any paper. They don't need anything to remind them. They're like, this is what I'm talking about. But it is well to have a paper. I'd say for all of you, as beginning off, as khatib, to have a paper. To remind you of the points that you're going to be talking about. And also, when you're looking at the paper, you're not reading off the paper. So this comes back to the first point. When you're presenting, you don't want to be just a robot reading off a paper, looking down the whole time. And it's going to take practice. You're not going to be able to make eye contact every single time. So, some advice is to memorize parts of your speech. Memorize the parts where you think 100% you're going to forget. And then practice in front of a mirror. Or in front of people. Which inshallah you guys will get a chance to do today. Surprise. <laughs> um, this is another thing. What did you guys just hear? Um. This is something that if you've taken enough presentation classes, 
You're not supposed to be saying um, um, um while presenting. Um, um, um means you're not sure about what you're talking about. Instead, they say utilize gaps. So for example, if you're talking and uh, you finish a point, you say, okay, the Muslims, they made hijrah twice. Then where did they make hijrah? Ethiopia and Medina. See, you can use a pause. When you use a pause, people start looking up. Oh, something's happening. <laughs> you know, I should, <laughs> did I, did I, they're going to think, oh, did I sleep for too long? <laughs> what happened? But it, it's also a good way to engage people. So use pauses and try your best to cut out any ums. Or like, uh, then this, uh, no, um. Keep the umming in your head. What, let, what, let your tongue only say the content, okay? So that's something to remember. And if you look in prehistorical Arabia, pre-Islamic Arabia, and even Islamic Arabia, the way that they would orate, fasaha, they call eloquence. The part of eloquence is the person doesn't stutter in what they're saying. So they're speaking, and they're speaking with confidence and directing it. And in poetry, that's, if you're looking for a good orator, you want to see that this person is able to get their content out without any stuttering. Otherwise, you can see that, oh, this guy isn't really sure about what he's talking about. He's not ready. He's not well prepared. So, eye contact, talk to the people, talk to the people, don't just read off the script when you're up there, you're talking to people and you're, you're not doing an essay review for yourself, okay, you know, I made a gram grammatical mistake and the Prophet ﷺ, he said, none of you truly believe until, oh, I forgot. You're not looking at your paper in order to correct your comments, uh, in order to correct any mistakes. You do that when you're reviewing your paper. But when you're presenting, you don't need to follow the script 100%. You have to be able to make it digestible to the crowd. So sometimes you add your own ideas when you're up there. You'll remember, oh, this reminds me of a story this hadith, that there was a sahabi who went, uh, he went to the marketplace to buy a horse. And then you go ahead and you say that, perhaps that's not in your script, but it supports your point. And in the khutbah, of course, there's going to be times where you get these ideas. Maybe not the first time, if you're giving it for the first time, you'll be scared straight. <laughs> trying not to make any mistakes, so you'll stick to the script 100%. But if you've been giving it for some time, you'll start, you'll start to wander. And that's, it is something good, but it can also be something bad. Because if you start to wander off the topic too much, you'll be talking, you're, the topic is about Dhul Hijjah, for example. 10 days, do good deeds. You have a topic over here, you're talking about um, you, you, some, you somehow relate it perhaps to the prophets. They did good deeds. Then you'll relate it, oh, we should fast. And then somehow you get to the fiqh of fasting. Huh? And then you're like, it is important at the end, you're like, it is important to learn our deen. And then, oh, oh yes, I was talking about the hijjah Let me link it back. But then at that time, you've probably lost our crowd and they're like, sorry, what were you talking about today? Was it the hijjah or was it fiqh? Or was, it was Islam. <laughs> we're talking about Islam. How many times does that happen? 
unfortunately, sometimes we go to khutbahs and that's what's happening. That the topic is, is everything. So the best thing is to be able to give verses from the Qur'an and hadith. But that's not the only thing we should be focusing on when presenting. As a good uh, orator, you should be able to relate to your crowd. And that's why if you listen, a lot of the people who are giving khutbahs, they add in personal stories. This happened, I met a brother the other day, and subhanAllah, he lost everything. But what he said stuck with me. And he said, as long as Allah is with me, I have hope, I have life. So this is a good point. I don't have that much life experience. I'm just in high school, right? It's true. The Imams, every single day, they're getting like five cases. Divorce, death, marriage. Kids are not behaving. Something else, right? <laughs> but us, we have to reflect. We have a topic. We've picked a topic. I'm going to talk about patience. Okay? I get the Quranic verse. I get the hadith. Right? And then I explain. I explain the Quranic verse. I explain the hadith. And now what? Am I done? You can be done. But you have perhaps 20 minutes left. <laughs> or maybe you have 10 minutes left. Right? So you think about your life. One second. You think about your life. Are there any times where I had to be patient for something? Are there any times where I couldn't wait for something? You know, there was this one time the new game called PS5 came out. My parents, they didn't buy it. <laughs> Maybe you don't say that on the khutbah, right? But you have to go back in your life. Maybe there are some experiences, you're not able to capture them in the time when you're doing the khutbah, but think about it while you're writing, while you're going on walks. There was this one time where I needed water. I, I really, I, I was, my throat was dry. And the amount, the need of water I had was is un incomparable. If I didn't get water, I was going to die. But once I drank the water, it's like I came back to life. You're thinking, okay, sabr. How does it relate to sabr? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the people who are patient, those people who are patient, they will be rewarded without any limits. The reward of going through the test and then finally getting finally getting a reward or finally getting something out of that test it will feel so much better that reward will feel so much better so you try and make these links try and look back in your life maybe you don't have that much experience in your life you talk to your friend maybe you talk to your parents and you get ideas, you get stories, and you put them together, and then you're able to present. But those things, they really capture people's uh, attention. Why? A story is much lighter than actually talking about something in depth. You probably, heard, let me ask, have you guys heard of Nu'man Ali Khan? Right? What do you think about his speech you're able to listen let's leave aside any of his like personal beliefs look look at how he presents he's able to deliver a good speech right 
people are captivated. Some of his events that he goes to, they're literally just called story night. Story nights. People just want to come and listen to him speak because the way he talks, and he gives personal anecdotes, stories, examples from his lives, and he makes it a more human experience. When you talk about, for example, Hajj, and you say, okay, there's day eight, day nine, Arafah, day 10, uh, the Hujjaj, they're going back and forth from uh, the places. I don't want to make a mistake. For us, how do we relate it here? Maybe you add a story. I know I read something about Malcolm X when he went to Hajj. How can I relate it here? Because when you're delivering a story to people, you're not just delivering information. You want things to stick with them. You want them to stay engaged. So the idea of storytelling, even in the back in the day, during the old days, there were people who would just tell stories in the masjid. These people were called qassas. They weren't looked at in a positive light <laughs> because they would make up things. And the muhaddithin, the people of hadith, they would say, don't listen to them because they're making up hadith just to make people feel good. So you don't want to go to that extreme where you're like, whoever buys olive oil and uses it in their food, they get jannah. Back in the day, that's what they used to do. Why? So people would buy more from them. They say the Prophet he used to love this food. Everyone's like, oh, really? They go by, you find the guy who's telling the story, his brother's selling food. <laughs> so we want to be also careful on the way. Sometimes people, sometimes speakers, they do make mistakes up there. Maybe they'll quote a fabricated hadith. And you want to stay away from that. So try it yourself. And you'll learn more about your research. How to go about research, what hadith, what Quran, how to you know, find the correct hadith for your point. You want to stick to sahih hadith or hasan. And if you're going to use da'if, you must know in how to use the da'if hadith. If it's fabricated, you want to stay away. So this stuff is all really important as well. But yeah, you want to make a connection. When you talk about some, your, your life experience, you'll be, people will be more willing to listen. They're like, oh, sahaba, unfortunately, Unfortunately, people will be like, Sahaba, those guys, they're like great people. We can't be like them. The Prophet ﷺ, he was a prophet. How am I supposed to be that good? So then you try and bring examples that are recent, right? There's some shiuch, there's some very pious people passed away maybe recently. What were their habits? And how was their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So you're trying to drive the point home with every example you give. You try and drive the point home. And sometimes people will go too much towards storytelling. And it, it turns out to be a feel-good khutbah. You go there, my iman is high, alhamdulillah. But then... Oof, there's nothing to do after. I heard a couple of stories. Now what? When you go to give the khutbah, again, remember these people, some of them, they only learn Islam once a week. You need to give them things that they can apply to their own life. So after giving a lecture, and you don't want to give the lecture for too long, you need to link it and bring it together. You need to talk about how they can now apply it in their lives. So the khutbah is usually split into two parts, right? We call the first khutbah and the second khutbah. The first khutbah, you're giving, you're proposing the problem. You're talking about this is what's happening in our communities. 
okay, this is what the Quran says, this is what the Hadith says, this is a story I can give. An example. So you're presenting a problem. And then when you come closer towards the end, you don't want to leave people in disarray. Oh, tayyib. The youth, they're getting, they're being misguided. <laughs> you know, they love talking, the shiuch, they love talking about the youth. They're being, they're, they're being led astray. May Allah guide them. Aqimu salah, right? <laughs> Sorry, what? Uh, so that's another trick you have to learn in storytelling. How do you make it more, you have to be as charismatic as possible. He, he, he asks, can I boost, can I boost the story? Can I add some flavors, you know, make it a little more spicy here? You know, so someone was going to the park with his dog, you know, I was walking. You can, you have to try in your, your best to not lie when you're giving the story. But no doubt, 100% it happens. People boost the story. They, they give it, sometimes they give it a totally new color. Maybe the brother was just, you know, he saw a brother, he needed help changing his tire. I saw this brother, he, he was in depression. He was looking at his car. He didn't know what to do. So I came and I said, brother, don't worry. Allah is with <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> Calm down, okay? So you don't want to boost it. You, you have to make it sound interesting. And that's part of storytelling where... You set the background. You set where it's happening. In Turkey, I was in Turkey last year. And I went to the masjid. The masjids over there are huge. Don't go too much into details. You just want to set it, the tone a little bit so that people are interested. Maybe you went there just to say that the people of Turkey, they're so nice, right? Something nice happened to you. You set the mood. You make it positive. You make people want to listen. Because sometimes it happens a lot. You're in the khutbah and you're like, yes, this, this is very tough. I can't, I can't swallow all of what the imam is saying. Like Islam is too hard. And no doubt when the Prophet ﷺ was giving khutbah, his face would turn red. They would say as if he was leading an army. When he would go on the mimbar, it was like he was ready to lead an army into war. So it wasn't all jokes up there. But you also have to understand your audience. You have to see where they're at. So you have to lighten the mood. Storytelling, yani, I'm not saying we're going up there to just tell stories. But there's a part where you want people to listen. You want to grab their attention, their ears somehow. So you try your best to make it sound like something went down. Maybe it's just you went and you listened to your parents, right? How do you form it in a way? Unfortunately, like as humans, we want drama in our lives. We want to listen, not in our lives. Maybe you want to listen about drama, right? You want to hear what's happening so when people talk about something happening in their lives, they're like, oh, I learned this guy, you know, he got into a fight with a, a gangster or something. <laughs> so try your best to wrap that story in, in ways that will engage your audience. So will will be attentive, but not forgetting why you're, of course, telling them the story in the first place, which is your topic and what you're trying to drive home. You had a question? Sorry? The tone.
So before we go into that, I want to just touch upon something before you go up and even give the khutbah. If it's a place you haven't given before, get there early. Also ask beforehand the audience, who the audience is, what are the problems and issues that are being faced in the community. So you know that. Now when you get up on the khutbah, there's some people, they start, and Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inu wa astaghfiru. And Allah said, all right, zero to 100 real quick. Sometimes you changing tones in such, you know, like quick is, is not the best thing. You want to build up. It's like, again, I don't want to bring everything back to storytelling, but to be an effective public speaker, you have to know when, how you're going to go and what at one point you're going to raise your voice and actually deliver something that is going to be beneficial. And some, some people, they're effective 100% screaming, but you have to know your audience. Not everyone is ready to be shouted at for the whole khutbah. So you have to be calm. Start off calm. And then maybe you can, you know, you go up and down. It's like a wave. Sometimes you, you, you take the audience somewhere, and then you're able to deliver the point. And this is why we need to have patience in our lives. And then you slowly come down. And then this is another reason why we need to have patience. So it's not a shouting contest. The khutbah, people come, they're tired. Some of them, they're taking break from work. Some of them, they're having family issues. You really need to know how to pick your words properly. Perhaps if it's a dedicated lecture towards young men, even then I wouldn't say shouting from the beginning to the end is good. Though it may be effective to some degree, you're not going to get people to perhaps improve themselves and whatnot. So you have to be very, again, Deliberate, deliberate in your tone. You don't want to be shouting at them the whole time. And of course, you don't want to be monotone the whole time either. So monotone is when you're talking at the same level the whole time. From the beginning to the end. So I woke up and then I found out that my friend passed away. I went to school. Are you really going through your whole life like at the level zero the whole time? We have emotions. We have to show enthusiasm. And then I know a brother, he found out, he got into the University of Medina. Or then I found out this brother, he got a job. Fell into sajda. Alhamdulillah. And then somehow you t if you're saying, you know, how to thank Allah, this is how you thank Allah. You get a blessing, you thank Him. There's something called sajda to shukr that we should do in times of good. We just fall into prostration. And you're talking to your fellow human beings. You're not talking to any kids. So you want to make it feel like that they have something to also learn, right? And also that they're not just being shouted down to. That, oh, the person giving the khutbah, he's also a human. He's not some too high and pious person where, you know, mashallah, the brother, all I see him do is finish the Qur'an every day. May Allah make us <laughs> on that path <laughs> to reading the Qur'an a lot. But you're up there as a fellow human being. You have to understand that you're talking to other fellow human beings and you're trying to get the best out of them. If it's talking about change and tawbah, right? You're telling people to repent back to Allah. You have to be, again, deliberate in your tone. You don't want to drive people away. You're, you're saying, for example, tawbah. You want 
of course, to leave an effect in the khutbah. So if it's tawbah, how are you going to get people to change their path? I know some brothers, you know, right now perhaps they're not doing the best things. And if you're going up on the khutbah to just put them down, step back down. <laughs> Don't go up. You're up there, your, your message should be coming from a place of love and sincere admonition, sincere advice for your brothers. It's not a place where you go up there and start bashing people. No. It's not a place where you go up there and say that, you know, I saw so-and-so do this in the... You're not calling out anyone specifically up there either. So try and wrap. These, these are the things you have to know, of, especially up there. It's not like any other normal speech where you're presenting a topic and you're going through contents. You want the best for the people who are listening to you. And inshallah, when you deliver a good khutbah, then you'll also feel like you have to now step up your game. Because how can I be delivering something and I'm not doing it myself? Right? And that doesn't mean you shouldn't. You're going to think, okay, I'm not doing it myself. Why am I adv advising people? Some people, they go to the, the extreme. They're like, I'm doing bad things myself. I'm going up on the khutbah to tell people to stay away from those things. I'm a munafiq. I'm a hypocrite. Now, if this was the case, right? If everyone thought like this, then no one would go up and say anything good or bad because I'm not doing the good. I'm not staying away from the bad. But as humans, we make mistakes. And if we recognize at the bare minimum that what we're doing is wrong, and we're trying to change ourselves as well. Inshallah, Allah knows the intention of everyone. And you can go up and deliver it in a way. A good quote from Umar ibn al-Khattab, which I remember is, he said, make your friends the people who are, who are what? Those that repent a lot. Why? Because they have the softest of hearts. They fell into that mistake. They asked Allah and they hope for Allah's forgiveness. So when they see someone else committing a similar mistake, or maybe they're in a different mistake, they'll also have more rahmah and they'll be more gentle towards them. As a khatib, this is from the Prophet's character to treat people in a respectful and gentle way. When you're up on their mimbar, you also want to remind, remind yourself of that. And then you also want to stay away from any political things. Don't talk about politics up there. You leave that, of course, for the imam. Maybe if you become an imam one day and you're forced to talk about political things, you still need some training on how to talk about that. But you try to stay away from political things and then stay away from talking about any specific groups. We'll come to that as well as another workshop, but you don't want to. There's a club on campus, haram to join their club. You know, all you're going to do is do haram there. The people are haram. What they say is haram. What they wear is haram. Don't. They're haram. Yes. So the scholars, they differed on this, and some of them said that you shouldn't share your personal sins from the past. Some of them, they, they allowed it. Why? The reason you're sharing your sins is not from a place of boasting about it. You're not saying, yeah, I used to go to the bar and I used to have this number of things, this number of things right and i used to 
drive this car. And I used to race this person. I was... Sometimes people go to that extreme and it sounds like they're like, they're reminiscing the times of their jahiliya. No, that's one thing you don't want to do if you're going to be talking about it. Because perhaps you may fall back into it. Second thing is, you're teaching, you're telling, you're sharing this experience so people learn from it. Right? So, I rem personally, I, I don't think I would be comfortable sharing my previous sins. But if someone, a speaker does, it's usually coming from that part. For example, I think Malik ibn Dinar is the one who quotes himself on saying that he used to drink. He used to drink, and then he had a dream. And in that, he saw his little daughter that passed away, and she told him, to reminded him of coming back. So then he left everything, he made hijrah, he went to Mecca and he stayed there, he became a scholar. And some people, they were thieves. They used to loot caravans in the Prophet's time. But then there is a story of the person, I don't remember the Sahabi's name, or it was perhaps after the time of the Sahaba, maybe Tabi'in. He heard someone saying, that, So they were reminded of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they changed their ways just from that reminder. And they mended everything with the people and they tried their best. So perhaps you're telling people in the context of wanting to change, change is possible no matter how far you've gone. Right? You have to know when you're actually sharing these things. You can't just be sharing it haphazardly. Yes. Yeah, so this is also a wise way of saying something, whether it's sharing like a negative experience or a positive experience. Maybe you're the person who did that sin. May you say, yeah, I know someone. There was a brother. There was a sister. And the same thing can be said about if you're saying someone does a good thing, right? There was a brother. He, he was amazing with his parents. He's an example. So you don't want to expose everything about yourself up there either. Like you have to be careful um, on how you deliver. So he said no politics, no specifying specific groups. And of course, uh, you want to remind yourself when you're up there, why am I talking about this? When you're looking at your, you want to write your khutbah first, okay? Make sure you write your khutbah before you go up. Not all of us are born natural, gifted, talented speakers. So make sure you write it and you question yourself, you critique yourself, you have someone else read it. Every single point, you ask yourself why and how does it relate? Why and how does it relate? Will this be effective? Okay, and at the end, towards the end of the khutbah, try and link by giving people hope. Give people hope on whatever the topic is and give them applicable things which they can do in their life. إن شاء الله we'll leave it for the adhan. قولوا قولي هذا استغفر الله لكم فاستغفرونا هو الغفور الرحيم. If you have questions, inshallah we'll talk about it after. After the salah, we'll also take a break.